Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming uh, along this morning. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah Gibson. I'm an open source infrastructure engineer at 2 c the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. Um, our job there is to deploy Jupyter Hubs into the cloud to facilitate research groups and education groups around the world to get on doing what they need to get done. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about um, a document we have called the right to replicate and how, and I'm going to explain what that is. And um, I'm, and I think it's a really cool thing that we should bring over into research software rather than just research, um, research infrastructure. Uh, and I'm really grateful to Neil Xu Hong for his um, keynote talk on Tuesday that kind of perfectly primed you all for receiving this idea that potentially principles are a good idea because I think this should be one of them. Um, so uh, I'd just like you all to, if you um, saw Neil's talk on Tuesday, I'd just like to, for you to all bear that in mind as I go through my slides today. Um, so, so I am at least working in, but I think we're all entering an age of large scale, re real time collaborative research that is being facilitated by the cloud. And in my current role, it's my job to des design and build these research platforms that not only connect the compute and the data, but the people too. And at some point, when you're building this ki these kinds of systems, you end up relying on someone else's machines at some point. And this leads to vendor lock-in. Now, while I was doing some research for this talk, I actually discovered that there are quite a few different meanings of vendor lock-in. There's also tech lock-in, but what I'm gonna be talking about today is a, um, a kind of lock-in where a customer base, a community, or a critical service is dependent on a single provider for products or resources. And this introduces risk. And that risk can present itself in different ways. So um, the very common one is that services are discontinued entirely and you end up having to rebuild things from scratch. There's this um, website I've linked to here, Killed by Google, which keeps track of all of the services Google has sunsetted over its time. Um, and if you've like built up your um, communication platform to, you know, rely on Google Wave, I'm really sorry, you're going to have to build that platform again. Um, another kind of risk I see a lot is non-fungible cre credits. Um, so you've got a, you've got a research grant to run some kind of infrastructure for a year and it's all on Google Cloud and you build that up and you come next year to um, refresh your funding and Google Cloud says, no, thank you. But AWS is like, sure, I will give you some credits. And then you have to migrate all of your services across cloud providers. Or even um, you see institutions buying into specific providers. And that means when you get into a situation where the tooling to work with those providers is like standard amongst researchers and you have researcher at institution A can't collaborate with researcher at institution B without learning a whole new tool chain. This is from the infrastructure perspective, but we see other kinds of lock-in as well. Software, uh, we all, um, I avoided an argument by not putting MATLAB on this slide, but <laughs> SPSS versus R, ArcGIS versus QGIS in archeology, span there's open source versions versus proprietary licensed software for getting our jobs done. It also happens in data. So um, I was talking to my friend Brad Bastian and he brought this um, really interesting case of like wearable fitness technology. I've got my um, Fitbit on. Um, no, there is unknown processing that happens to the raw data that is collected by your Fitbit or other wearable tech. And the algorithms can change within um, between software updates. And you don't know if those algorithms apply retroactively um, uh, or from the time of the update. And Bastian actually told me that one day he woke up to his phone giving him a critical alert that his resting heart rate had raised by like something like 60 points. And it just turned out that the Apple Watch he was using had stopped counting his sleeping heart rate when calculating his resting heart rate. And like, 
that means if you want to like switch from switch from Fitbit to Garmin or whatever, it's really difficult because you don't know how that data has been processed. The uh, that new data means nothing to the new system. And okay, wearables are like a very small cost resource on a, like um in in the scheme of a research grant, but this kind of workflow applies to like imaging data from microscopes as well. And when you've dropped a 10K budget on a microscope, that kind of vendor lock-in really starts to feel a little bit more restrictive. So how do we begin to tackle this? Ultimately, we avoid vendor lock-in by choosing to use software, tools, whatever, that are open, or if, we, if you have to work with someone's proprietary API, they add a layer of abstraction so you write a general tool and have an implementation for AWS Google. Um, Terraform is a big example of this, but now I can't talk about Terraform because of the licensing change. Yeah. Um, but who makes this choice and when in the cycle of developing software? And how do we make sure that we are making consistent choices as a team or an organization? And to be clear, I'm not giving this talk to you because I believe that none of you care about open source or sustainable software. It's actually opposite. I think you all care a lot, but sometimes it's a struggle to be like, to articulate why you want to do this thing openly versus others. Um, and I want to give an example of how we've tackled this at Y2C for the infrastructure perspective. And it is with, with our community right to replicate. So this is our principles for making open, sustainable, portable infrastructure. And we basically just wrote it down. Okay. Um, so the link is here to itc.org slash right to replicate separate by hyphens and got a screenshot of it here. So our right to replicate gives the communities we work with the right to replicate their infrastructure in its entirety elsewhere, whether it be on another cloud provider or on on-premise um, systems, with or without our help. We just give it away for free. And it is a set of guidelines that define the technological requirements that enable us to do this at each layer of the stack. So at the bottom here, we have the cloud provider infrastructure, which we say must be portable, Anything that 2 I2C itself uses must be open source, but we don't enforce this on our users. So we can see the user environment should be open source, but in some cases, user needs may override this. This is how we make our MATLAB people happy. We don't ban MATLAB. We just might not prioritize helping you if something's gone wrong with MATLAB if we also have someone who has a problem with Python. Um, and so by make, writing down this document, we've done, we've achieved a few things. First of all, is we've reduced the toil in moving services across providers because we have made sure that these abstraction layers and open source tooling is used where possible so that these things can very easily be deployed on different platforms. The most time intensive part of this process is syncing users' home directories to the new file store. And what this does is it transforms the commercial cloud from an economically competitive market into an interoperable research utility. And we also enrich upstream open source software communities because there's no secret source in what to ITC is doing. We're using open tools. Um, there is nothing we keep in the company that isn't just designed to um, make engineers' lives more easy. So for a sense of scale, to I2C in its entirety, up to and including the executive director, is eight people, four of whom are engineers. We are serving over 50 communities running probably in the order of 100 hubs. We have tooling to make that easy, but the actual tools that our communities are using, um, they're all open source because the right to replicate isn't just about, oh, Google has taken Kubernetes away. We're a startup. What if our funding goes away? It protects them against our service going away as well because it's all upstream open source. So why do I think this is important? I think it's important to have a shared understanding of goals and values 
Because while a project team organization may have particular values and principles and or rights, if you want, that's what you want to call them, uh, individuals will, may join for their own reasons. And um, so writing down shared values is a step towards a shared understanding and a purpose. You help make these choices we have to make every day in designing software systems, infrastructure systems, whatever, more consistent. And it creates a space in which you can achieve work that aligns with it. Um, I've got, a, by the way, this is a DOI link that you can um, get these slides on, in which case you can then go to this link, which is a talk given by Brian Cantrell at um, Oktoberfest in 2017 on tech leadership principles. And when I'm feeling just a little bit bleh, I go back and put this video on. I highly recommend it, if particularly if you're a leader of a group, but just anyone, find an hour and watch this talk. It's very funny weirdly patriotic but deeply moving in what it means to be a to have to hold principles in the tech space because we ultimately have a responsibility we are working at the intersection of research and technology in a rapidly technologically advancing society and our work as RSEs therefore impacts this society and we have a responsibility to ensure that that impact is positive and to protect the scientific tool chain and that remains open and this is kind of like why we framed the document as a right um as opposed to just like this is a thing we commit to do we actually believe believe like much that is everybody's right to learn how to read and once you learn how to read and speak you can communicate and share ideas and uh, once you share ideas and opinions you can participate in a democratic society we believe open infrastructure to do uh, work in open science is a right as well so um I'm going to tell you what the right to replicate means for me as a, an engineer, um, not as a person with like a strategic org level responsibilities, but we are eight people. So when I do say, hey, we do this, I tend to get listened to. Um, but so th this is what this document means to me as an individual. I joined to I2C because of this document. It was actually written before my time there because it strongly aligns with my principles. And my opinion is if that you want the best people who are gonna be mission aligned in your job, write down your values and put them somewhere public. Um, we get a lot of cover letters stating how mission aligned uh, and how inspiring they find like our documents such as right to replicate and people who believe in this mission and want to push it forward. And it just makes hiring a bit more of a pleasure. It means that every day I take pride in my work um, that's not to say that my career before this was unprideful, but um, this is definitely some of the uh, most value aligned work I've, I've had the pleasure and privilege to do so far. It also gives me clear guidance for prioritizing and rejecting work. One part of my job is service desk. And when I get a feature request from a community, it's much easier for me to say, can't support that implementation because of our right to replicate, but we could do it this way. Whereas without that, I may have to like seek sign off or like guidance from my superiors. And um, given that we're a completely remote um, company, barely any of us work in the same time zone that can like slow down communications. But I now have agency to kind of make these decisions on the fly because we have such a clearly defined document. And it just makes it much easier to do my job because we have all of these open source tooling and uh, the, the, there's bugs. I can go and talk to the maintainer um, community. I don't have to sit in like some proprietary, although sometimes you do when you find out that Google Cloud has run out of compute because Black Friday, that was a weird bug. And um, so, yeah, my job just becomes a much more easier thing to do because we're, we're working so openly with tools that are flexible and built by the community. Um, so that's why I believe these kind of principles um, really help to stand up projects like this. So my call to action for you all, similarly 
to Neil's call to action is what does a, what would a right to replicate look like for research software? Don't fork our right to replicate because it's very infrastructure, infrastructure specific, um, but it is under a CC by license. So you are welcome to um, remix and reuse with attribution. Um, you don't have to call it a right to replicate either. Um, call it one of the principles that Neil talks about on Tuesday, um, but just write it down and put it out there and start a discussion. And even whether it's at a team level, an organization level, or at, at the RSC society level, what are our principles? What are we standing for? Um, and start to open that discussion. Um, and not just for this, for the other 12 principles Neil suggested as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, how would you cope with the critical parts of your uh, infrastructure, for example, Kubernetes? That doesn't have a clear alternative moving um well, moving off an open source license. Yeah, good question. Um I so to ITC right now is in an incredibly privileged position because pretty much all of the team, all of the engineers who work there are also Jupiter distinguished contributors. Um, <laughs> so we have do that have some influence in that um, community. We are going to have to address the Terraform issue very, very soon. Um, but that has got an open source alternative right now, which is OpenTF, which has been picked up by the CNCF, which Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And so that has a life form. If Kubernetes goes off open source, I don't think to ITC is going to be the only people who are scared. Um, and I, I suspect there will be a big multi-community effort to addressing that in the same way that within days of the Terraform licensing change, there was a fork that has been picked up by the CNCF. Um, so I think like it's it's not gonna be a two ITC problem, it's gonna be a multi-stakeholder problem that will that will force an open source alternative. Um, academics often need a bit of a push in these areas. Do you have initiatives to work with them? Uh, or others to translate their papers outputs into online notebooks? Um, we do have a community success team that's kind of helping um, with the sort of how do you do cloud workflows? What's the best practices around this? Um, I don't think we need to push so, so much because uh, we're at the minute working off word of mouth. So the people who approach us already think cloud working and Jupyter workflows are the way forward. So, um, and we tend to help them become advocates in their institutions and demonstrate, look how awesome this is. And, and then they kind of bring the rest of the in institution along with them rather than us kind of like going in and being like, you should be doing it this way because that never works. <laughs> Do you expect uh, backlash or political moves or some kind of other um, pushback from the big cloud, cloud advisors um, if if the research community manages to avoid better luck in using something like this? I don't think so. They're getting paid either way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, have you worked with UPRN or reproducibility? Um, I have not personally, and I don't think to ITC uh, locked in, if there's anybody representative of those communities who are either here or online, uh, do send me a DM. Ooh, I think we have, yeah, we have time for the last question. So besides its clear benefits in reproducibility and your work culture, how do you advocate for and benefit from the rights to replicate in the funding and organizational requirements? Um, Again, I, I I find this is a case where like we don't actually have to advocate a lot. People come to us in the same way that I came to ITC because I loved that document. People come to us because they love that document. And I actually, um, in our right to replicate, it states like communities can do it with or without us. And I actually think that will be the um, smallest like percentage of people enacting their right to replicate. I think most people will be like will be like the moving to Google to AWS kind of scenario, I, I feel like the real value add to ITC brings is 
people like me who have expertise in site reliability engineering and managing large um if any of you any of you have used mybinder.org i have been a, an operating team member keeping that infrastructure afloat since 2019 i have a lot of experience in keeping these kind of platforms alive ticking over and traditionally members of the community have been doing that role out of necessity but so we we work with the Pangeo community and when we started work with them, they were just like, we don't want to hear any more about anything related to Kubernetes. We want to get on with climate science. Here's money, you do you. Um so like I like that's the value add, but um I would also like to see kind of like training initiatives where you can imagine a four-year deal with to I2C, what where over those four years to I2C's involvement decreases as we train someone in the community to take over ownership of the infrastructure at the end. So, um, and like from funding an organizational viewpoint, uh, we kind of like work with the, the, the community representatives to just unlock how much faster people are able to do science and get cool re results. My colleague, Jim Coliander has a great tool uh, to talk about. He met someone at a conference who had been struggling with this data set and Jim like, pulled up our demo Jupiter hub and got him set up in about five minutes to be doing his like getting on with his science and not battling with the infrastructure and that really is our goal.